All right, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Doug Davis, um, and we have Timur on the on the call as well. And we're we're here to talk about the CNCF Serverless Workgroup. Um, now, the the working group itself really has two main projects that are going on right now: cloud events and the serverless workflow. So, what we're going to do in this session is first talk about uh, what's going on with the cloud events. Just very very quick update there, and then the bulk of the session will actually be the workflow specification and stuff. And that's that's the more exciting piece for you guys. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into the cloud events stuff. So I'm not going to talk about what Cloud Events is. I'm going to assume everybody already knows that. Um, instead, I just want to bring you up to date on what's happening with it since the last time we've met, which I guess is last KubeCon North America. Uh, since then, we've released version 1.0 of the spec and it includes not just the specification, but the transport bindings, meaning how do you actually map the Cloud Events metadata to the various protocols, HTTP, AMQP, all that other good stuff. Also including the encoding, I'm sorry, also included are the encoding formats of how to um, encode the cloud event metadata into JSON and Avro, as well as a primer to give you some basic information about some of the decisions we made, maybe some design or implementation guidance, stuff like that. Now we also have a whole bunch of SDKs out there and some of those are very, very active. So in particular, take a look at things like the, the Java one, the Golang one, JavaScript, very, very active. Um, C Sharp as well, um, because there's been a lot of activity in that space because these SDKs are really the main starting point for people to pick up this stuff. It just makes your life a little bit easier for dealing with these cloud event uh, metadata things. Okay. Now, because we've gone 1.0, what's next for us? Well, the biggest thing is community feedback or customer feedback, right? We need to hear from other people who are actually using it to make sure we didn't miss anything, get anything wrong, and stuff like that. And to be honest, as of right now, we really haven't heard a whole lot, which is really, really good. But we're not just sitting back and waiting. We're also looking at sort of the next set of pain points related to the cloud event itself. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And what I want to do is quickly touch on the two bits of work that we're doing related to this. Now, if you understand what cloud events is, it's about how to help the producer get the cloud event or the event to the consumer. So it's sort of the tail end of the process here. So let's talk about the first spec that we're going to be looking at in addition, and that is, go ahead, next slide, and that's the Discovery API spec. And what that's about is the consumer, in essence, as the name implies, discovering who produces the events of interest to them or what events each producer actually does produce. Okay, mm -hmm. because obviously if you're going to get events, you need to know who to subscribe to, uh, what events you can get from them, and stuff like that. And additionally, you need to figure out how you actually do the subscription itself, right? Do they support HTTP, maybe AMQP, or do, does everything come across Kafka, that kind of stuff, right? So you have this discovery step in the whole process. Next, you then have this, the subscription API itself, okay? And that's how you actually do the subscription, okay? Where do you send the, the subscription request to? Uh, how do you tell it you, you want the events delivered over HTTP versus some other mechanism? What are the format of the messages? How can you filter the messages if they support filtering? Stuff like that. It, these are all things that you would naturally expect from a discovery and subscription API, but they're not really actually written down in any place in an interoperable format. And so we wanted to try to address those concerns. And then finally, of course, when you're all done, go to, go to the next slide, you end up back at the cloud event spec, right? And you use that to help get the, the event from the producer to the consumer. Okay, and so that's what we're really focusing now in the cloud events group itself it is the discovery spec as well as the, as the subscription specification. Now, these specs are relatively new, um, but we are far enough along, we're actually planning on doing an interop event in the November timeframe. So if you're interested in either of those specifications, and you're in particular interested in actually starting to code these things up, please come and join us and, and join the fun, okay? Now, with that, let me hand it over to Timur to start talking about the workflow specification. All right, thanks, Doug. So Serverless Workflow is a CNCF sandbox, sandbox project. It's part of the Serverless Working Group, so the group that Doug uh, works with. Also, also it's uh, open source and Apache 2.0 license. It's a community project, so here you can find some information about our GitHub repo, website, and the community chat and meeting information. The serverless workflow defines a declarative and domain-specific workflow language. Declarative, and it is not expressed in low-level code, however, it defines an abstraction that can be described in both JSON or YAML formats. And domain-specific, as it targets the domain of orchestration of event-driven and distributed services. And just to show this as an example, on the left-hand side, we have two simple requirements written in natural language. And these are when, for example, a patient has a bladder infection, we want to notify some 
a doctor specific to his condition. And the similar thing is uh, for, let's say, regular heartbeat, we want to notify a cardiologist uh, in this case. On the right-hand side, you guys see that serverless workload does not express these requirements in terms of code, like if else statements and things like that. Neither does it express it uh, using terminology that does not fit its domain. If you look at the bottom right <coughs> corner, we see that we can translate these requirements straight into things of our domain, which are events, such as patient having a bladder infection or irregular heartbeat, and services that need to be invoked in those cases, which is notifying a particular doctor for those conditions. Now, <clears throat> sorry, serverless workflow is based on standards. We use the cloud event specification to define events that can be either produced or consumed during workflow execution. And also we define correlations of the many events you might have in your systems using the cloud events format. Uh, we use the open I API specification to define uh, services and then the operations on the services which need to be invoked during workflow execution. Finally, the serverless workflow provides uh, workflow patterns or control flow patterns dealing with execution order, error handling, data management, and things like that. Now, the overall project goals is to define a language that can be used across multiple different runtime services, which then can be deployed in many different situations, some of them being container or cloud platforms. Now, in order to start utilizing events within your workflows, you first have to define them, which of many we're interested in for our particular uh, use case. So we want to define an event that are either consumed or being produced. And as you can see here with serverless workflow, we have a direct one-to-one -one mapping between how these events are described using the cloud events specification format and how you define them within your workflow definitions. And for event correlation, it, we said it was the same thing. We again use the cloud events format, specifically the context attributes to define correlation between the many different events you might have in your system. Now, once we define an event, we have to start interacting with it. So what can events do within workflows? Events can start workflow instances, they can continue existing workflow instances, they can be, like we said, produced or consumed, and they can be also used to make logical decisions. In the right-hand side, we see a very simple definition which just says, before we end the workflow, we want to produce an event. And in this case, our event is a type of workflow completed event. And then this event, which is produced by our workflow execution, then can be consumed by either other workflow orchestration workflows or other different types of services they might be interested in. Similar is for services and invocation of services. Uh, we want to define <clears throat> the operations that need to be exit on the services that need to be executed during workflow execution. In the left hand side, we see a simple open API definition. And in this case, it's just a part of it which defines one uh, particular operation, get inventory, which is one operation, of one of many that could be available in this particular service. On the right hand side, we see how we actually define the, uh, uh, this operation and the service. It's basically we have an operation parameter which contains the URI or the path to the definition of the service, the open API definition, and also the unique identifier or the operation ID of the operation that needs to be invoked during workflow execution. So you don't have to deal with things like authentication and putting things inside of your workflow definition uh, there is not really related to a, the execution of your workflow model that is very specific to the invocation. We actually <clears throat> use the open API specification for that as well. Now we understand that there is many different types of services and how they are invoked. So with serverless workflow, you can invoke service restful types of services, so services that are exposed to some particular endpoint, but you can also uh, invoke event triggered services, so services that are triggered by some particular events. The last part of defining your workflow is the control flow logic. So here we define the states and the order in which these states are executed. In serverless workflow, states can be seen like a little black box. They, it receives input, either some data or an input event. It does its control logic 
part of what is a, a particular needs to be done. And then it produces some sort of data output or an output event as the result of the execution of this particular part of the control flow logic. Now serverless workflow, we decided to go with explicit control uh, flow, which means you clearly define um, what you're building. Oftentimes in workflows and, and control flow logic, um, you, we do things on a very granular level, which sometimes becomes ambiguous. And what I mean by that is it's hard to figure out which part of your control flow fits together and which parts of your control flow are kind of like a unit that perform some particular piece of the solution of your business problem. So in the bottom, we see that we have decided to, that each state has a type and the type really describes really the control flow logic that this particular state does. If a type is, for example, event, you know that the control flow logic, which is in, uh, inside of the state, deals with events and the payloads and things like that. If the type is switch, for example, you know that we're making some sort of either data-based or event-based decisions and things like that. Now, <clears throat> you can define a whole bunch of different control flow patterns with serverless workflow. You can define sequences where you execute one piece of uh, your workflow orchestration after another. You can do looping structure, sequential parallel execution, um, decisions based on, like we said, either data or events, uh, things like that. But we also deal with a little bit different things, like for example, human interaction during workflow execution, which is sometimes might be very important in different use cases. Now let's take a look at all the different project components of serverless workflow. So far we've been talking about this middle piece or the language. The serverless workflow language is defined via JSON schema, which defines all the rules and things like that on how you actually, what you can define within the language. Around that we have a set of language extensions. So these extensions do not influence <clears throat> workflow execution or the control flow logic, however enhance it in order for runtime systems to be able to make some things like overall performance improvements in terms of cost and things like that. In addition to that, serverless workflow also provides things like SDKs. We have them in Java and Go currently. Uh, testing kits in order for runtime implementations to see their compliance level towards the specification. And we also have a set of plugins for IDEs and things. So let's take a quick just a look at, for example, one of these uh, language extension, the KPI or the Key Performance Indicator extension. This allows you to uh, the <coughs> add information about the workflow, which are the expected uh, results during workflow runtime execution and compare them with the actual ones that you uh, gather during actual workflow uh, runtimes. So this uh, little language extension can help us improve performance of your workflows, the cost effectiveness in cost and effectiveness. Let's take a look, quick look at the Java SDK. The features of this are parsing of both JSON and YAML uh, serverless workflow language formats. It has a fluent API, so you can basically create your workflow definitions using just the programming language. It includes validation uh, against the specification. And it also allows you to generate uh, diagrams based on either your JSON or YAML or your object model represents your workflows. And the last thing we're going to look at here is the uh, Visual Studio Code plugin that our uh, project also provides. It, it has code hints and code snippets. Uh, they're based again uh, on, the, on the serverless workflow JSON schema or the language definition. It again provides also validation for both JSON and YAML files and it allows you to visually preview uh, your diagrams. As, so as you're modeling your diagrams in Visual Studio Code, you can uh, preview them at the same time. So now, <laughs> done with the introduction part, I wanted to do a, a demo. It's a very small demo, but I kind of wanted to see, uh, show you guys how easy it is to get started with workflow orchestration, and also, of course, with, with, with the serverless workflow itself. So, for this, I just want to set this up a little. When you start doing using workflows to orchestrate uh, things, really you're solving business problems. So what you have to do is you have to first understand what is your business problem, and then you want to see what kind of services you have available in your systems that you can utilize in using some sort of control flow logic 
given, provided to you by the workflow solution in order to solve your business problem. So for this simple example, to kind of go back in slides, uh, our business problem is patient onboarding. So, and now let's take a look at what services we have available in order to solve our problem. So for this, I'm going to exit out of the presentation. Sorry. And I'm going to have the application running. This is running on localhost right now. And I'm going to look at my Swagger UI. So we now this application again is running my localhost locally for the sake of the demo. But these services in real world scenarios, of course, would be deployed on a container platform or, or somewhere. Um, distributed basically but here we see that we have two services we have a patient service this service is responsible to to register a new patient into a system and then we have a scheduling service which then takes this new patient and given their conditions like we discussed before in the slide assigns the particular doctor that can best uh, treat their condition of course in a real world scenario we would have a much bigger set of services and things like this so for our uh, sake of the demo is just two. So to look back at our business um, problem, which onboarding a patient, in order to onboard a patient for our demo, we want to first uh, invoke the patient service, and then we want to invoke the scheduling service to assign a doctor to this particular patient. So let's kind of try it all together and do this. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead here and open up Visual Studio Code. And after I close like 50 million windows, like usual, <laughs> sorry. Now this is my application. We have, it's a little Java application that runs on Quarkus. You can really use any particular language that you use. And it uses a Java runtime, an open source Java runtime of the serverless workflow implementation. So we have two resources here, which represent our two services. Um, now, what I wanted to do is to show you how to get started. The first thing I'm gonna do is go to my VS Code extensions and type in serverless workflow. And I'm gonna download this extension. Now this is the extension that we provide from our serverless workflow project that we talked about earlier. Now I already have this installed, but this will be the first step. Once um, I have done this, I can go ahead and start creating my workflow. So pretty much anywhere with Java and Maven under resources, uh, we want to go and create a new file. So this file is going to represent our workflow. So let's call it uh, onboarding. And in this case, we're gonna just do a JSON definition. You can the same thing do YAML. So one of the things that once you downloaded uh, the VS Code extension for serverless workflow, you get code hints and code snippets. In this case, we will see that it shows me all the different parameters that I can start using on a top level definition, uh, which are based on, of course, the JSON scheme of the, of the underlying language. So in this case, I'm gonna give my workflow a unique ID of onboarding. Make sure I spell that right. I'm gonna give it a name, which let's say we say new patient onboarding. Uh, I'm gonna give it a version, uh, let's say 1.0. And at this point, I want to start defining the different functions that need to be executed when this workflow is running. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a functions array. This is real quick. And I want to start defining my two functions. The first function, I'm going to give a logical name of, let's say, uh, register new patient. And now I have to define how do I actually invoke this function. The only thing I have to do is, is create an operation parameter which then points to my uh, open API definition, which I have here. And we can take a look at it also visually in VS Code, which is kind of cool. So in this open API definition, I see my patient service and the post, which means I want to create a new patient has an operation ID of add. So let's copy that, go back to our workflow. So all I have to do is a relative path to slash API slash open api.json which is my open api definition and i have to give it the unique uh, operation id so i'm just going to copy that and now we're going to define our second service that we would like to invoke in its operation and let's say assign doctor 
to patient. And it's the same service uh, open API definition, but here we go down to schedule and we see that the one we want to call is, has a unique ID of a sign. So let's go do this and that's it. So now that I've done, I'm done with my uh, service definition. So I want to start creating my control flow logic. So for this, we have uh, an array called states and my, I'm gonna create a new state. I'm gonna give it a name of, let's say let's onboard and that's it. And now I have to give my state a particular type. Now the extension is going to list you all the different types that you can uh, choose here, depending on you know what you want to do. The one we're going to use it is a simple operation state. It's a state that runs one or many operations, in this case, invocations of our services, either sequentially or parallel. So I'm just going to give it a type. Now, I don't, I have to say that this is the first state that gets invoked when my workflow instance is, is created. So I have a little star definition with a kind, there is different ways to start the workflow. So in this case, we're just going to go ahead and uh, start it without any extra information. And I want to say my action mode here, I want to execute these two services sequentially because we first have to onboard a patient before we assign a doctor to it. Otherwise there could be some cases where you want to execute in uh, parallel. And now I'm just going to define what actions do I want to use? And the first action I'm going to use is uh, to invoke my, my register new patient service. So for this, I don't have to redefine my services here. I just reference them by their logical name. And after this, I want to call my assigned doctor service. Now, I have to tell the workflow that after the execution of this particular state, I want to finish workflow execution. So I also have to give it an end definition. And again, there's different ways of ending workflows. For example, sending an event, killing the entire, all the processes running, things like that. But we just want to simply uh, end it in this case. And I have some, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> me and Jason get along just well. So you see just with 30 lines of code in YAML, there will be probably about 20, of course. We have created a simple workflow. So let's now go ahead and see if I'm gonna restart my application. So in addition to the services, since we all have them running on localhost, if it picks it up and let's see what happens. We should just start up in just a second while we wait. All right, so that's done. Now, one thing I wanted to show you guys is that workflows are not some weird thing that you have to use a special way of invoking or it's different than, for example, how you define your services. Workflows are really the same. And here we've seen the definition of our two services that were running on our system before we created the service workflow. Now, if I refresh this page, you will see an onboarding service. And what is this? Well, that is the workflow we have just defined. We have basically taken our workflow definition and it self deployed it as a service. And that has the advantage now, not only it's a RESTful service, that we can call this endpoint version 1.0, which is the version of the workflow they defined, and onboarding, which was the unique ID that identified by, uh, that we put in our workflow, we can actually interact with the service orchestration just like another service that we have defined pretty much anywhere. So and that, this is really kind of what we wanted to do. We have a local host here, I created a simple page, and this first form allow us to enter uh, some information about a new patient. And when we click on board, and to show you guys, I'm not making this up, we have a little post, HTTP post to our endpoint, which actually will trigger a new workflow instance execution. And then on the bottom, we will see the results of the workflow orchestration, which should be a patient and also the doctor assigned to the patient given the patient's condition. So let's just give it simple, some name John. And this guy has, uh, unfortunately, a bladder infection. And as we see, when we clicked onboard, our serverless workflow was executed. It contacted the patient service, it stored 
the particular patient. You contact their scheduling service as we have defined and assign Dr. Elizabeth to this particular patient. Um, so that kind of really, guys, shows you how easy it is to get started these days with workflows and also how it is easy to get started also with the serverless workflow specification. And that's uh, all I have for the demo. Let's go back to um, the presentation. Doug, you want to do this or should I? <laughs> go for it. You're on a roll. Keep, keep going. All right. So, well, uh, thank you guys very much. I hope you enjoyed our talk. Uh, for more information, of course, Cloud Events, uh, great specification, you, Cloud Events.io. For serverless workflow, we have serverless, uh, serverless workflow.io. Uh, we hope to see you guys in the community. And if you need more help, here is a contact for uh, Doug and myself. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, everybody.